Hello everyone and welcome to another interview on human. Today we will be interviewing someone you have probably seen before on Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. She is an activist, a model, and also an artist. Today we will be hearing her story. She goes by the name Abina. Hi. Hey, how are you doing? Good, how are you? <laughs> I am good. Like, that was pretty quick. <laughs> uh, how is it over there um, in Colorado? I did interview somebody recently from Colorado. Um, it was um, a great, great interview. It's um, windy. <laughs> um, it's, it's a little chilly, but it's it's nice. Nice, nice, nice. Is the sun out? I can see it reflecting on the side of your face, actually. The sun? Yes, the yeah. sun. Is the sun out like that? Like, <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm Troy. I know that we didn't get a chance to speak previously. Uh, for all those that be tuning in, I am the owner uh, of Human, uh, the multimedia platform where we interview people from around the world to hear their perspective. Right. So. Uh, moving forward, I want to start off the interview by you introducing yourself uh, to the audience today, for those who don't know. Um, hello, I'm Abana. I am a an artist, um, an activist, an educator. Um, yeah, that's where I am. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, real quick, what do you educate people on out of that aspect? I sure. So I'm um, an adjunct professor. I teach photography at Colorado State University. Um, and I specifically work with ancient um, uh, photographic printing processes. So some of the first pr photographic printing processes that were used before the darkroom. Wow. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Thanks. That's cool. What is, um, I want to start off with how you were raised, uh, I did uh, read your bio and get a hint that that you were is Irish. Your father was Irish American, and your mother was um, uh, from Ghana. Am I correct? Yeah. Was it interesting being raised by parents from two different cultures, and what did that look like? Um, yeah, it was. It has been. Uh, still continues to be. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the times. When we were growing up, my I have two two younger brothers, um, and when we were growing up, our dad worked really hard to send us back to Ghana, and that was something that we would have um, the opportunity to learn culture um, from a firsthand experience. And um, my mom is from Waniba, and um, it's it's uh, outside of Cape Coast, uh, which is a small. It, it was a small village, but now it's it's uh, a city because it's got a university now. It's a, a technical college, um, and so yeah. Um, growing up, you know, like my, my brothers and I didn't really work really hard to um, understand our culture because of you know Western civilization and whatnot. Um, and um, growing up in Colorado, you know, like um, everyone was uh it's now starting to become more embracing of yourself you know in the world and i think that having that platform i think has been something that's been wonderful for a lot of people who are mixed cultures um mm -hmm. and growing up now you know like i think we're all still growing i think we're also like becoming older in a sense you know we're all growing um and I've been working really hard to understand my culture. So um, Apana is my middle name, which is, it means Tuesday born um, from the Fanti tribe, which is where my mom is from. Um, and so, you know, like Jasmine is my, you know, educator name. And so my students call me Jasmine and my, I, I like to use my artistic name as Apana because it's like free to express. It's, you know, like, like a Nan name and um, my ability to 
you know, great. Nice. What is uh, one thing about the culture of Ghana that you can uh, teach us here today in this interview that most people may not know about? <clears throat> um, Ghanaian culture is vibrant. Um, there's a lot of uh, laughter and a lot of people are energetic. Um, food is, is really um, a really popular thing that is celebrated. Um, so like people like to drink um, spirits, you know, like beers and and um, apatishi, which is like this fermented palm wine. Um, and it's it's normally like mostly celebrated and drank by men. Um, but it's uh, quite spiritual in a sense, but it's it's a nice drink, you know, kind of puts hair on your chest in a sense. Um, but it's it's like tequila, but it's um, yeah, that, that that's something. Um, but you know, before, um, like, okay, so during the Atlantic slave trade, for instance, people were actually traded for objects. Um, and so like some, some of the things were like, um, spirits, so like alcoholic beverages, um, and then it became, you know, like some muskets and, and whatnot. And then it started to become, uh, carry shells and then carry shells were used as a form of currency, but there's been multiple different forms of um, monetary systems that have been used and it has um, been documented that cowrie shells were um, used as one of the primary monetary systems. Wow. Continue. Um, well, hold please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> You might have seen a carry shell. It's like this guy. Wow. Yeah, it's, this beautiful. has like some um, magnets that are attached to it. But yeah, it's yes, I have um, seen it before. Yes, when I was growing up, amazing. Yeah, and so it's huge in in um, African American culture, and um, most people don't know that's what's the that's part of the history of the Atlantic slave trade. Can I see the shell yeah. again, please? That is, yeah, that right there, wow. That's such a beautiful pattern. Very nice. Where did you get that one from, if you don't mind me asking? Um, I think, I have no idea. Um, they, they come from warm waters. So like they, they come from like the Mediterranean Sea. So like in Greece and um, also like near Florida waters and some of the, the Galveston, Texas area, um, warm, just like really warm water areas um, mm -hmm. of the world. But this, I think my mom got it from some sort of, I think Mexico. Is where mm -hmm. she got it, I think, yeah. yeah. Can you educate us to um, the process that happened and when it came to ending the uh, ending slavery in Ghana, I did look at that and I found that to be interesting. Um, I was wondering if you could give us a little bit more insight about that. Uh, um, I wasn't there, so I, I can't, you know, like give an accurate statement on where and like what had happened during that time period. Um, I do know that there was. Um, A lot of people that worked really hard to fight and and that diaspora, but it still actually like lives and lingers within the the culture um, today. Mm. Mm. I almost want to ask you, what is your definition of a freedom fighter? Uh, uh, and <laughs> yeah, actually, that I think that's a great it's question. Funny you know? because um. my mom's family on. Like from Winneba, they are actually freedom fighters. Um, so mm. we, what I've heard is like we would fight people to, to like from taking um, people from the land, um, and protect them from being taken overseas. Mm. Now this question is going to be a little bit tricky here. Uh huh. Do 
you think freedom fighting comes at different levels? Like, uh, and I want to draw kind of a picture of, of that, right? Like, I think everybody has their own fight, right? Like, some people fight for equality in certain spaces. Some people fight, you know, the fight concerning the differences between the races. Um, some people fight for an econ uh, economical reason. But when it comes to, like, systematic fights and things of that nature, I see that there's, like, a level of... <clears throat> A level of, um, I think there's a level to what freedom is it, it, it is that we're fighting for when we say freedom fighting. So I just want to hear your like your perspective on that. I think freedom can be a lot of different things for people. Um, mm. You know, I, I think that there's a freedom, like I was a slave to my skin for a long period of time. Um, like wanting to hold back on, you know, like embracing my spots. And then it became something like a way of living, like a mindset, you know, like um, about embracing yourself and being comfortable with who you are. Um, and I think a lot of it, a lot of things with the world has to do with our skin color or things that are based around skin color or skin tonality. And um, as we, we evolve as humans I think that that this should be something um, more worth the fight in a sense to fight for people to have you know equality and you know um, equity and to be included in certain circumstances and to be thought of or considered um, versus, you know, like scouting out somebody who doesn't represent the same um, image in a sense. Mm. I like the way that you said that freedom could mean different things to different people, you know? Yeah, it can, but, you know? It's very deep. I, I actually want to take a little bit of time to reflect on that because I'm like, it's true. Like, um, I think the freedom that uh, I, I, I I fight for is to under is to gain understanding between uh, everyone, you know, um, especially because I constantly see uh, a rise in technology uh, that's putting us back. That's you know, if we're not careful, we could set us back. Um, and so I do want us to kind of I'm not saying evolve, but have a freedom where, like, let's say I don't have to work like, like a nine to five job, right? Like every single day, right? Like I do uh, in my daily life. <clears throat> but to have the freedom to actually live my life without having to worry about, you know, substantial income, where it's going to come from so that I can focus on evolving myself, you know? Yeah. And I think that's just deciding on where you want to invest your time, because I think that's the most valuable asset that we have is our time and how much is our time worth. And as we begin to decide like what whether you know like money um, cash value is going to be worth more than somebody's time and effort um, I, I think those are things that we need to take into consideration as we become more of ourselves um, throughout the years mm. question what do you think well what is important to you excuse me uh, is it my value is it a mix of things like maybe one or two things that you can name off the top of your head uh because to be quite honest we do live in let's say a system where we need to survive right by certain means uh and so it has to be like a balancing act oftentimes you know unless some of us are born into certain substantial situations that benefit us in certain ways right yeah it's um it is challenging. Um, yeah, I, I do think that, you know, like some people have been given a lottery in a sense, you know, like a birth lottery where they're born into maybe, um, you know, like a upper class family. Um, however, I think that we make our own luck, we make our own freedom, we make our own opportunities. And with each stride that we make in this world, I think that that creates this, um, impact in the way that we you know enter and leave the world you know people have this ability of creating something and it's from the 
the strength in their mind, you know, like mm -hmm. you, you have your body is something that is essentially a slave to your mind. Your, your mind is like what controls your body and how you're able to, you know, like function, you know, how you're able to think, create, um, interact, engage. And what we do with our time and what we do with our, um, our strengths, how we apply them to life and how we, um, you know, like scout out other people who might be more strong in certain criteria, And that helps strengthen maybe an idea or a concept that um, is in research and development and is, you know, taking its initial steps off of the ground. Amazing. I really like the way you put that. I wanted to back to the questions I had because I felt like I kind of went off track. I have a word to wait. Sometimes. <laughs> um, um, what is your favorite fruit from Africa and why? It's actually the avocado. Um, yeah. Um, avocados are actually like this large in Ghana and like the seeds are like this big and so like when you cut it it's like mostly just fruit and it's it's delicious and it's like fresh from the tree, it's it's amazing. Um, papaya is also really good. I I like the coconuts as well, but um, yeah. Wow. Can you? Uh, I was going through your profile. And I saw this little, little shea butter fruit. Or what is the name of that fruit, and, and where is it from? I was so curious about that. Um, about the court. Uh, locals call it like a shea fruit or a shea nut um, or shea. Um, mm. But it's from the northern region of Ghana, where I got that from. That's from Tamale. Um, in the northern region, shea butter is actually made by women. And it's a natural organic salve that has been used for centuries on, you know, skin, hair, um, rashes, a, a bunch of different um, skin conditions. Like sometimes, like if you burn yourself, um, you can actually put that shea butter on it and it'll actually heal it. I'm not supposed to say that because it's like FDA, you know, like and whatnot, but um, it is true. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so it, and it's actually used in like makeup and, and, and whatnot. Wow. Um, <clears throat> what is one thing about life you can say was different when you were younger compared to the current day? Um, I think that living as an artist, for instance, you know, I think that having this perspective that has been very different. I've always been a photographer, but I didn't realize it. And, um, you know, like having the, the fact that images and photographs have become digital more now so, more now so. Um, and I talk to my students a lot about this, about the fact that there's a, an importance in permanence and, you know, like tangibility and visceralness of a photograph, a physical photograph versus a digital file that you look at on your phone. And a lot of people are just kind of just snapping pictures and they're not really making pictures. And there's a difference between, you know, like taking snapshots and then constructing, composing, and then looking at the light and how it's hitting the person that you're photographing. And as you look at the angles and the shapes and how we're really actually constructing this image, it becomes something that's worthwhile in documenting. And while you're documenting these photographs, these moments, you're capturing something in time. And as you capture this moment in time, it lives within the photograph. And the importance of that is because like when you're, when you're looking at a photograph, there's this timelessness that exists within it. And looking at a digital file, you know, like the moment is continuing, but it's not going to last in a sense. Mm -hmm. It's, there's not, this permanence that that exists within it whereas a photograph you know like it's it's tangible it's physical you know like you can it's an object it lives outside of 
the negative that was created from or from the um, original photographic file. But I think that a lot of people need to slow down and to, um, you know, like compose your image, figure out what's worthwhile, what's worth your focus and your perspective. And um, it helps create a better narrative, a stronger narrative around the concept and the creation of like what you're working on. That's what I've noticed. Like people need to pause wow. a little bit and, you know, like utilize the film or um, even though it's free to take pictures on your phone, um, you know, like space takes up as well on your memory, on your device. So I think that having the idea and understanding of, you know, like, like what moments are worth capturing and what is something that you can actually just like live in the moment. Mm. You think digital photographs take away that moment of living within it? Do I think what, sorry? Do you think that digital, the process of digital photographing things digitally takes away from living within the moment because everybody's trying to possibly keep up with friends or just I want this for the gram. Yeah. <laughs> it's what we do oftentimes. And, so. Yeah, I do. I think that people pull their phones out more so to kind of seek for inclusion where, um, you know, like people think that other people are posting on social media for validation, but it's actually like a sense of inclus inclusivity to be included and to be considered um, with likeness of imagery mm -hmm. and how that might draw in attention from other people um, to kind of also create, you know, like some sort of bridge of connection and, and um, community. Um, photography is something that actually creates, I think, community. And today's actually the last day of like month of photography. It's, it's the, the whole month of March is the month of photography, but um, yeah. So I think that, yeah. Side note. Sad question. Um, I'm going to tell you a little backstory. I went through a process where um, I had a friend talk to me. He was like, hey, man, you know, I see you're getting real close to what you're creating with human, which, you know, is, is not, it's not a bad thing. But what he saw was my identity started to almost become that, you know, like online. Like, hey, what are you up to? What's your name? Like, hey, I'm Troy, but yeah, I own human. You know, this is online. You, know, you can go and check it out. And I was doing that so much that I found myself like, like mentally, like if I didn't post almost for a second, like, oh, does anybody even know I exist, right? And I'm pretty sure there are a lot of other people who can relate to that scenario and situation. So I took six months away and I became my own individual away from that, right? And then I returned back after six months with a new headspace. Now I'm diving into all these different platforms, but I understand that I am still me, right? Outside of my presentation or me being involved on these platforms all the time so what is your take when it comes to that and dealing with you know being, being on social media to a degree if if you know that that you know if you personally manage yours um what is like what is your outlook on that uh with this generation nowadays because uh, everybody seems like they're rushing to be seen yeah and it, it's like not everything deserves a response and that's something that i'm also like really working on as well um and you know like social media is something i think that can bring us together but it also can tear us apart um just like anything else in the world um and i think that you know like having something that like I, I used to be like a marketing manager for a chemical company and like we would structure out like different posts in a sense like you can like make um a schedule for like your monday through friday or like if you're posting on the weekends like a weekly kind of schedule schedule and then you can kind of create content before you post it and then you can give yourself time to think about what you want to post before you post it um, and then that also kind of helps you found like concrete and um, fa finalized essentially like foundational words that you are intending to say versus things that might be said in the heat of the moment. And mm -hmm. um, that, that 
also might help prevent um, other anxieties that might, you know, like live and exist within, um, you know, putting yourself out there on social media. Wow. Wow. How does your upbringing impact your drive to be successful? Um, well, I'm from a middle class family. My my dad um, grew up in northern Colorado, and my mom grew up in. It was, I don't think it was a village then, but like she grew up in a small town in, in West Africa. So, um, you know, like my parents didn't have a lot when they were um, starting, but they've grown into a lot of different um, areas in life. So I think having two foundational mentors and, um, you know, guides, if you will, that can help kind of steer me in a way that would be, you know, show me that I can build character and still be the same person that I was when I was younger, but, you know, like more mature, more developed, more e evolved into somebody who can um, put their mindset and work towards the things that they, they want to achieve in life. Um, yeah. So, um, Hard work ethic, I think, is something that I was surrounded by. So that's something that I've kind of integrated into my my own like life practices. Mm. What does ambition look like for you? <laughs> <laughs> what is what is? Because I looked on your page and I saw uh, the post about ambition. I was just very curious about what what does that entail for you? <clears throat> ambition. Fearless, gutless, just kind of trusting, having faith. And, you know, like, I think a lot of the time when I was younger, I, I wanted to have a plan that was set in stone. But the thing is, like, stone moves, you know, like the earth shifts. And when our grounds are, you know, disturbed, it becomes something that makes us uncomfortable to make shifts in our, or pivots, if you will, within our lives and um you know like developing vitiligo for instance was something that that gave me a sense of loss of control so i i couldn't control like how i would look um i couldn't control the way that people would speak or react to me but what i can control is the way that i respond to um you know like my my difference you know, like my my ability to be different in the world. And I think that um, having the ambition to understand that I wasn't alone was something that really kept me going. And then I started to meet people with vitiligo or human fibulism or, you know, like cerebral palsy or um, just people who have all alopecia who are just different, you know, um, and also associate with the word difference and it became a way to um, become ambitious about the way that we can connect as a society versus the things that are meant to um, tear us apart that can actually bring us closer together. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know, what is vitiligo or I guess the scientific version? Uh, vitiligo is essentially a fancy term to say dope ass skin. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, no, it's if you're wanting the scientific definition, so vitiligo is an autoimmune skin condition where the body attacks the cells that produce melanocytes, which are skin cells. Um, and that results in depigmentation, which is a lightening of skin color. And that, um, translates onto the skin. They don't know, quote unquote, what happens or like what causes um, depigmentation. Um, however, I do believe it's stress induced. As I've been talking to people around the world, it, it has like this, um, it has like more people than not actually have um, experienced like some sort of traumatic event or some sort of um, experience where 
they were financially stressed, for instance, or maybe they were um, experienced bullying. Um, and sometimes, you know, you know, like sometimes people as young as six months old, four months old can develop spots. And then somebody as prime as like maybe, be 60s or 70s, they can also develop spots. And in that development of spots, it's um, a questioning of identity and, and where do you exist? Where do you belong? And how do you fit in in this world? So um, mm. ambition, I think, is something that lives within. And it's a matter of you summoning it and um, allowing it to wake and coexist and manifest within in the world. I really like the way you tied that in together. That was cool. <laughs> You're welcome. No problem. Um, how did how did you eventually? Because this is uh, definitely a test of the mind, right? Like, well, first let me ask the questions in order. When did you find out, or when did you start to notice? Excuse me, that you had vitiligo. And what was that impact like? And then how did you? mentally work your way through that to where you're at now because you're like extremely strong you know pushing forward i know we all have our ups and downs but thanks i I appreciate that it's not easy you know i think everything um takes time and practice Mm -hmm. um when i was first developing my spots i was about 21 years old and um i have had friends that have gone with me to you know like treatments so that I can repigment the cells that have depigmented or, um, you know, like go through a process of changing or trying to alter my identity of who I'm supposed to be. Um, now, it, it hasn't been an easy journey. I think everyone's journey is a little bit different than that, the next person. Everyone has something that, you know, like they're, they may be insecure about. Um, but I go something that I'm finally proud of and it really it's a blessing in disguise that's one of my friends has told me that before um but you know I think it took a lot of self work and a lot of reflecting on like myself and how I want to identify and you know like I have even still to this day I have like identity questions about you know, like who I am, who am I and how do I exist and live within this world? And, um, you know, like I think having photography as a tool has been something that has been very therapeutic. You know, like when I first developed spots, I was taking and documenting pictures of myself and, um, documenting the transitional, you know, drastic, drastic change, you know, like in, in, depigmenting and losing skin color and losing sense of identity. And then I was able to also then like kind of journal and jot ideas and thoughts about this process of being able to have no control of the way that I look. And in throughout years, you know, like I started to meet people with vitiligo and start to document people with vitiligo and hear their story and their journey. And it became this coexisting cohort, if you will, of the ability to show that, you know, like even though skin color might be different, um, you know, like we all share skin. We all have that same thing in common. It's, it's something that protects our internal organs. It's something that is our barrier from the external world. It's, it's something that we all have to protect, you know, no matter your skin shade or your color, you have to wear sunscreen, you know, like, um, you know, like even though people who have like richer skin tones, um, I've seen a baby in Africa who had been sunburned by the sun because he was on his mom's back while she was selling fish in the market, you know? Um, it, it's, it's something that I think a lot of people neglect and take for, for granted um, is our skin. Yeah. Indeed. Hey. Hey. It's funny that we at times take it for granted, and it's oftentimes one of the greater issues in our existence, right? Yes. <laughs> <It is. laughs> um, uh, moving forward, what was um, what was your process of self acceptance? I, like I said, I was scanning you know through your Instagram page, and I saw that you was in the People magazine. 
Um, and one of the titles did address the fact of uh, self-acceptance, which I thought is a big, big thing you know, for everyone across the board, no matter what you look like, who you are. Um, there has to be that bridge where you learn how to accept yourself wholeheartedly. Close and long. I think self-acceptance can actually look like many different things. You know, like self-acceptance can look like accepting the fact that you have vitiligo and um, going through the process of going to a dermatologist. Um, it can also look like looking at yourself in the mirror and telling yourself that you're beautiful and putting on makeup, maybe to cover up, maybe to accentuate. I, I think that um, there are a variety of different layers that exist or manifest within the that that whole sentence. <laughs> 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 I lost my, yeah, head, so, my bad. <laughs> no, it's no, no problem. I have to still accept that I'm short, right? At the end of the day, so <laughs> you know, I, I go through my own journey of self acceptance uh, in my life too, especially when it comes to my flaws and battling perfectionism uh, as a creator. Yeah, and I think as we're trying to accept ourselves, we're sometimes we actually might be easier on people next to us than we are on ourselves. And, um, you know, like, I think that working on being kinder to ourselves, I think is something that is a very important part of the practice in self acceptance. And like being, you know, a little bit more gentle with yourself, you know, like you're not perfect, like nobody's perfect. Um, and I was a gymnastics coach for, you know, like 13 years and um, nobody's perfect, you know, no, nothing's perfect, but you know, like, I think that we have the the ability to change our focus and, and shift our perspective on what is um, beauty and like, what is, what is something that is worth accepting. And I think that once we begin to accept ourselves, we'll begin to accept other people for being different. And in that mm -hmm. process, it creates this inevitable interwoven blanket, if you will, that we were desperately need in this country, um, you know, for people to come together and, and to be kind to each other and to um, really show empath and that ability to connect with others, I think would be something that will um, strengthen our, our community and our world. What does and and just to notch it over, like just to next door. Um, what does self love look like, in your opinion? Self love is again. I think it's so different for everybody. You know, like I think that people have this ability to love themselves in a way that's listening to their body. Like I actually found out that I'm allergic to eggs, and eggs are in everything, <laughs> and so. <laughs> I actually like listen to myself and um, listen to my body. So like what I was doing is like cutting out things that didn't align with like either um, my myself internally or like externally. Like if I was like breaking out, for instance, um, I, I started to listen to the way that my body was responding. And that actually happened with the way that I was interacting and engaging with people as well. Um, so like, it, it almost became like a way for me to remove toxins in a sense. So anything that became toxic to my body or to my mental health or to anything that disrupts my flow so that I'm able to be productive, I started to remove it. And um, as I started to remove it, I started to feel better. I started to feel really good. And then I started to find a way to be at peace in a sense. So anything that disrupted my peace, I, I actually, I either didn't give an intention or I didn't, um, I didn't um, engage or interact in it. And um, in doing that process, you know, like I found a way to become, you know, like more happy. And, you know, like in doing that, I, I found out different ways that made me happy. So I started to go rock climbing and then I started to go to the gym. I go to the gym like maybe for 30 minutes every single day and it's, 
you know, like it's not much, but it adds up and it really does like help and it gets you into like a kind of a routine and a mindset that helps you, um, you know, like want to feel good about yourself. So then I start eating healthier and then I start drinking more water. And then, you know, I start getting into this mindset where I'm in a better place, you know, like, I'm just like, you know, like, Oh, I, I am starting my day off with positivity. I'm, I'm grateful for waking up. I'm, I'm grateful for this instead of like, Oh, I have to go to work, you know, like I have to go and do this, but it's, it's something that like, I think that starts with just like maybe even like a walk in the morning or stretching, you know, like mm -hmm. drinking some water before you go to bed or um, writing a journal or, you know, like cutting out people who are toxic or cutting out, yeah, setting healthy, healthy boundaries and, and is, is definitely a form of self care. And um, in Colorado, I'm really grateful for this. Like we're really, we're really blessed for this, but we have mm -hmm. hot springs. Um, and so like, sometimes like if I have like skin inflammations or if I have, um, you know, like if I, if I just need like had like a really rough week, you know, like the hot springs are like an hour from where I live. So I can like just drive there and then kind of come back and I feel rejuvenated and I feel like my skin feels better. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I think helps and constructs like a better mindset and, I don't know, self-care and self-love are just something that I think that we neglect as people because we're just like so invested in, you know, like I have to look better. I have to look and look, you know, I have to look, look, um, or one up, you know, and it's just, why can't you just be happy and content with like where you are and then want to strengthen those, um, core qualities about yourself. And I think that more people need to find their purpose and then they can become happier. And, you know, like we work these nine to five jobs and then as we work these nine to five jobs, we're not focusing on our purpose. And when we work that job and we stress and we still work and, and we're like, okay, well I'm stressed and I'm tired, but I still really want to strive for these dreams. And as you're striving for those dreams, you, you find this way to kind of make time for that, um, that goal and that obstacle and um, in, in, in that process, then you find out new ways of um, demonstrating like, like who you represent and who you are to the world. And yeah, that's. Wow. So I wanted to first, first start off by saying that I am developing a morning routine as of right now. Uh, I'm in a very transformational stage in my life um, where <clears throat> <clears throat> oftentimes we have crutches. I'm not going to get too focused on myself, but I'm releasing certain crutches uh, that I feel no longer serve me. And so I've started going to the gym myself. Um, and also I try to do a half an hour to an hour, but not a day. I do it when I feel like I can yeah. um, and move at my own pace. But a healthy morning routine that I just also wanted to implement for people is putting them their phone in a certain mode. So my phone allows me to go into what is called sleep mode, where it automatically turns on do not disturb. It turns the whole screen black and white, and then I lower the brightness of the screen. So even if I do look at the screen, I'm not alerted right away and jumping up out of my sleep and trying to uh, rush into my day, right? Um, because the way that you start your day is very important, and that's something that I'm learning. I have not mastered it at all. I'm not perfect at it. I'm just going to go ahead and say that, you know, for everybody who's watching. But it is something that's worth giving a try, and you'll see how it changes and reshapes the way that your day flows, you know, moving forward. Uh, wonderful. You said, I mean, the hot springs sounds great, oh, though. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's life-changing. Um, and you, you've, like, seen, like, those, like, little monkeys, like, in, like, the hot water, and they're just like, ooh, like, <laughs> you, yeah, it's just like that, you know, like, it's so amazing. Especially, like, when it's snowing, you know, it's probably like my favorite um wow. oh i wanted to ask you your trips to africa before we continue we're going to get back into africa later on the interview i do have some more questions uh regarding that to a degree but how was it? like please explain to the audience but also have never been uh to africa how was the journey it's home for me you know like it's it's somewhere like we've been going since we were younger but 
like um, I've brought people there before and I want to kind of create like this return project that would bring people back. And um, I think that it's, it's, um, it, it fulfills the soul. It, it um, nurtures a, like your internal connection to the, to life in a sense. It's, it's the motherland. Nice. Wow. Well, what is one thing about Africa that people don't know that is positive? I think we see a lot of images on the screen uh, of this real, like, I feel like downside, if you ask me, uh, of, uh, of Africa. Um, you know, children in need, I know that's, that's, you know, definitely a thing in certain places in Africa, but I also have I've heard of its richness, but I have never really seen as much of that advertised uh, here. In yeah, that's unfortunate because the richness actually exists within the land and mm. the people and the culture and the um, the traditions, you know. I think that a lot of people associate, you know, Africa as like one large country, but it's multiple different countries on one large continent. And... Um, you know, um, each culture, each tribe, you know, like there's so many different dialects that exist within, you know, like one tradition or that, for instance, like um, Fonti has like Chi and it has um, Winnebarian and it has a whole variety of different um, tones, if you will, of the way that people communicate and respond and, um, and, and practice this tradition um like another like one thing that is a downfall is i think that like people need to come together i think that a lot of people in africa ghana like i speak on behalf of Ghanaians, but not i'm not actually like i'm not born in ghana i was born in the states so um which is a different conversation because like i actually would have been born in ghana if if like today was then but it's another conversation but um mm. the uh the thing is like the land in africa and in ghana like it just has so much richness in in like soil and in um resources and um you know like i think that is something that is a downside because i think that people don't think of africa as rich but it is it's pretty rich you know like it has a lot of vibrancy and it has a lot of um culture that are are very very much um, alive, you know, like um, timber is, is a huge um, uh, uh, resource that comes from Africa. Um, you know, uh, chocolate, cocoa, um, gold, you know, shea butter, um, fish, you know, all of these things that are like kind of like taken in neo. It, I'm, I'm like trying to make sure that it's like not, you know, like I, I'm political, but like also. Um, yeah, it's like neo-colonialism in a sense because of like the the way that people are still left in poverty um, because people are going and buying things for a low price and then um, coming up to America or coming up to the Western cultures and selling for a high price. And that then leaves people still kind of struggling in, you know, like... Um, a country that's kind of still healing from colonization and we call it a third world country, but it's actually a country that's healing from colonization. And um, as we begin to evolve our way of thinking and evolve the way that we kind of interact and engage with others and, you know, like different countries, you know, like we're all trying to make it, we're all trying to, um, you know, like have this, niche figure out this niche that we belong in in the world and um in doing this like we come up and come across different communities and cultures that we can actually integrate into our own practices and into our own lifestyles that mm -hmm. really truly become um impacting and important and life-changing mm -hmm. 
I'm going to go ahead and ask this question. I was meditating on it for a while. Like, should I ask this question? I'm like, I'm going to go ahead and ask this question. <laughs> um, according to your understanding, do you think that all, 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 all um, <clears throat> black people come from Africa? I did read a book that kind of was a little controversial. I believe back in my day. everyone comes from Africa. Um, I believe that. Uh, I believe everyone comes from Africa mm -hmm. through the. Um, and I mean, like, I, I wasn't here, like, all of those years ago, but like, um, I believe that like, through um, evolution of mankind, that people kind of scattered. And, you know, like, if you look at people from different cultures, there are features that exist within every single skin color, um, you know, like certain noses, or eye shapes, or smiles chin like everything about like the human structure actually like people exist within different bodies um and yeah it's it's how much sun that was kind of exposed to the evol like evolving kind of human that began to shift and transition and that's you know like from my own research and study and like that's something that i've kind of you know like decided on within my own um mindset but you know like there's other theories there's other um there's other uh possibilities that might exist um as people can come up with their own um ideas of how you know like how and where people come from uh i, I, I asked the question just because uh, i read a book called before the mayflower uh, a while back, it was like, like oof, maybe like 15 or maybe 18 years back, uh, and the book explained about how there were uh, people of darker skin tone already here in America before everybody got brought over here. I mean, um, and then there were like videos that I stumbled upon that was like, you know, the discussion between like what the Native American really, you know, looked like. So it was just a conversation I feel like is a is an interesting space to dwell in. Um, yeah. And to kind of figure out in itself to uh, just kind of piece together history, as you said before, none of us were there. So we're really keen on going in on our perspectives and what that looks like. Even though we weren't there, we actually have these wonderful things called photographs that actually, um, you know, document that moment of time. And, you know, like it really does show and demonstrate these different um historical um moments that were worth documenting and yeah you're right though like we weren't there like you know like how how does one determine um like the truth of of um our history you know and i think that with the banning of books and um you know like i think that there's issues with that i i can't get into too many political discussions but um mm -hmm. You know, like I think that there are issues with the fact that, you know, like certain books that have been read in our um, history that actually define a little bit about our history um, are being kind of removed from academia, which as a college university professor, um, I find that a little problematic. Mm. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Wow. Uh, just while we're focused on the education system, um, <clears throat> without you getting too political, uh, do you think there's like a small siege going on with education? I did read an article regarding uh, the education system um, that basically uh, spoke about um, them taking away certain math books or something of this nature. Yeah, I was uh, in Florida when I discovered it yeah. happening or when I heard about it. And then I was like, hmm, I know that there's history books being changed and technology in itself can change a lot, right? You could rewrite a whole bunch of things within technology. Wikipedia is actually a really good example of that. <laughs> so uh, continue, I just want to hear your perspective as someone who uh, works in the field of education. Um, I think that understanding where your sources are coming from is something that's really important. Um, you know, like I think a lot of people are first to Google and then research and then, you know, decide that's the source that they want to base their information off of. 
However, you know, like there's books that have been written and published, you know, like where they've been, you know, like verified in a sense um, to, to an extent where, you know, like it's been, you know, like researched and developed in a sense. Um, but um, yeah, I think that um, it's, it's challenging, you know, I think that having um, to fight another fight to keep actual information that has constructed our history um and you know like i i share some images with my students about critical theory you know critical theory is essentially um it's essentially coming from the horse's mouth like it's coming from like the authenticity is coming from the person who has is it's narrating narrating on behalf of a specific community and it's it's voicing these um, injustices that might have occurred within um, specific um, marginalized communities. For instance, you know, like um, books that are being banned or like topics that are being re like re removed from curriculum um, mm. within American history that address specific parts of the Atlantic slave trade or specific um, you know, traumas from, you know, like the Native American civil, like in, in then from the Civil War. So like, I think that a lot of people just have to understand that, like where you find your sources, I think is important. Um, and also understand that photo manipulation is not new, you know, like it's also something that existed even in the 1800s. Um, people were actually able to do like Photoshop, like in the sense of like removing of something in the dark room and, um, and then that actually modified, and I'm talking about Edward West, uh, Edward Curtis, who photographed Native American um, people um, who, um, there's like a lot of dichotomy around the fact that he was a white man and he was photographing a Native culture that was dying. But without his photographs, the Native culture wouldn't exist. Like, I mean, it would exist, but like these, like the, the preservity of the imagery and like the culture through those images um, was able to be preserved is what I'm trying to say. Sorry. Um, but with that being said, you know, like, I think that a lot of people um, take for granted imagery and photographs and like how that exists and manifests because what I was trying to go at is like he decided what was important to be portrayed for Native American culture. So like there was an influence that was existent within the imagery but he would actually go through in photoshop and he would remove it and that would, would be a way to kind of alter the way that was being seen for native culture and then if you looked at the way that native american culture was being photographed by native people it was actually a lot more different it, it showed um not like more of like the romanticism of the culture but more of like the celebration of the culture and you know like in this pivotal point that we are in in academia i think that there is a lot mm. of consideration that needs to go into the redevelopment of curriculum and as we are redeveloping our curriculum we're actually trying to make it more relatable and more accommodatable for the students who are actually taking the courses or like you know like obtaining the education because you know like we as educators are investing in our future and our future is the students like those are those are the people who are going to go out and make those changes in our world mm. and um you know like when i was in graduate school um at cu boulder i, I took entrepreneurial classes and they they said that you know like some of us we're we're the ones who are our generation are the thinkers we're the ones who are watching what our parents were doing and while we're watching we're helping the 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 next generation who are the doers and they're going to be doing all of the things that we are thinking about and that we're wanting to help fix and transition in this world and in doing that you know like we're creating you know like opportunities we're also creating these different methods of of responding to the issues that are occurring in our world and helping create different um, different means of uh, responding to trauma. Mm. Mm. 
So I so two questions come to mind. One is <laughs> they were really photoshopping photos from yeah, it's, the 1800s. It's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, but like not like, like with a computer, if that makes sense. So it's like actually like manipulation with like the negative and removing it and then exposing certain areas where um with like uh yeah, so it's it's a whole thing. Yeah. Um, and in your opinion, how um how does one work past certain traumas in their life? Everyone's at a different point of healing, you know, like I think healing is like kind of like essentially like where we're kind of trying to become fluid in our interweaving of life practices. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, like kind of being uncomfortable with addressing the issues, you know, sometimes that might be talking to a therapist and talking about those issues and also might look like painting something it also might look like writing something and I think that everyone has some sort of tool that they've learned within their life that they can apply to their own method of healing and um, you know like healing is not going to be linear healing can be up sometimes mm -hmm. it can be down sometimes it can be not getting out of bed some days it can be you know like the ability to, to take a shower and brush your teeth, you know, like, and I think that that is something that a lot of people um, forget, you know, like the fact that healing, it, it can come in waves. And in those waves, you want to ride it sometimes, you know, like you want to make sure that like, you feel those emotions. And as you feel those emotions, you don't let them sit like, you don't let them consume you. Because um, when you let the emotions consume you, then, then you just blow up and then it's just you know people are yeah so i think yeah. people need to actually like really do some internal work with the traumas or issues that they may have occurred um in their lifetime mm. it's an amazing conversation uh i see you're into photography <laughs> what is the most beautiful camera you've seen so far well, um, <laughs> there have been some really amazing cameras that people have built themselves. Um, like, so you can actually make a camera with a box, like a cereal box and just a little bit of aluminum foil and some tape, um, for instance. But there have been some lenses that people have and um, they welded it to something that they built this box and it, then it became like this, like, 16 by 20 large format camera and um it, it prints film and then from the film or not film but like you put black and white paper in there and then you expose the photograph and then it actually becomes a negative and from that negative then you can create a positive but it's pretty amazing mm -hmm. to see like the fact that this large quality photograph was being able to be made from you know, like this huge camera, um, 16 by 20. And it's like completely analog. So it, there's there's nothing digital except for like after it's been made, you can actually then take uh, um, your phone and then you can actually like scan it and then it will turn into a positive, which is kind of cool. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Um, um, matter of fact, when you're, when you're, uh, taking a photo what is what is the feeling that comes over you when you're looking through the lens at the at the person you're about to take the photo of um like what is that what is that special aspect of doing photography that really captivated you you know i when i started photographing i was developing my spots but i also um was photographing my brother's wrestling um, they're, they're both high school wrestlers. One of them went to college to wrestle and one of them's an MMA fighter now. And in that transition, because I, I wanted to be a biology major at first, and then I decided that chemistry and art was more of my thing. So I decided for photography and I loved the chemical component. The fact that you have, um, this freedom to create something through light and chemicals and the response from that is art and um i really loved the fact that i was able to kind of document my brothers in 
capture a moment in time that would never be able to be relived again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like of documenting their wrestling matches and then sharing the pictures with them and they would get excited and, you know, it, it just became like this whole um, excitement of being able to kind of share something with them and to relate with them um, through something that I could do, which was just photographs. Wow. Amazing. When did you start modeling, by the way? I just, I didn't want to shift over a little bit into the career that uh, I've seen. Um, you made a really great career out of that, I will admit. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I actually used to model when I was younger. Um, like one of my first modeling sh gigs was for a church for my neighbor. Um, <laughs> And I was like maybe like seven or six. Um, and my dad would like, was not about it. Um, <laughs> and, um, so I didn't model again for like another 10 years. And then when I graduated high school and I was in college, I, I then started to model, but then I developed vitiligo and then I stopped. And then Shannon mm -hmm. Winnie came out and then, um, and then I, I um, went to graduate school and then decided like what I wanted to do with my life and some photographers started to text me or, you know, like, uh, like via like, you know, DMs on, on Instagram and say, hey, you know, like I would like to photograph you and then it kind of pulled me into um, the understanding that there's beauty in everything. Um, how did you, how did you turn Ooh, how did you t turn the tables in your favor when it came to modeling with vitiligo? I think that is an amazing journey in itself. <clears throat> um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I just, I just, I honestly just like rode the like rode the the flow of the water and and just allowed things to happen. Um, any opportunity that kind of like came across my door, I, I accepted and um, just like saw where it would take me to. Um, and then just appreciated uh, each each endeavor that I've been able to encounter. Wow. Wow. <laughs> um, was it difficult uh, uh, modeling? What are one of the pros and one of the cons you think that uh, come with the field of modeling? I don't think a lot of people fully understand what's behind the field. So being somebody who works in both in front and behind the camera, um, it's it's hard as a model to not understand like what the vision is from the photographer. So like if the photographer has doesn't have an idea and they just start start taking pictures and then this conversation between you and the, the photographer is quiet, then it kind of becomes like this awkward like I don't know if I'm doing a crappy job, I don't know if I'm doing a good job, like. And then it kind of helps, um, like, a conversation. I think, like, as the photographer, I'd be like, you know, like, I, I like the way that the light hits your face in this angle, for instance. So can you move your face this way? And then that kind of, like, allows, like, the light to hit and then um, make alterations and, and, and whatnot according. But as a model as well, like, I think it's, it's hard... Um, to also it's, it's actually not that easy um people think it's easy but it's actually really hard you know like to try and keep your skin like clear and to also take care of your hair and to take care of your like your nails and um you know like maintenance of your body you know like it's it's um it's a job you know like it's wow. and it's also a business too so like people think that it's just like you know like oh i'm this model is just like this stick figure in a sense, you know, but no, it's like, you know, like people have entities, people have LLCs, they, um, they work really hard to kind of keep that kind of brand and that image going. Mm -hmm. um, also who you associate yourself with um, also has a play into your image and your identity. Um, yeah. Wow. 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 That's crazy. I, I did. <laughs> When you talk about who you associate yourself with, so are you able to like keep your personal life away from like that? I mean, I try to. Your model? Yeah, that's, that's why I use Abna. Like Abna is like it's also my name. Like when I go to Ghana, people they call me Abna. They don't like 
my family calls me up and up, they don't call me Jasmine. And um, like, um, you know, like kind of like kind of creating like some sort of like identity that might exist as well. Oh. Yeah. Um, I do have an appointment though. So like, um, I was gonna say like, is there any other questions? Can we wrap up by chance? Yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem, no problem. Um, I wanted to say, um, I have two or three more questions for you, actually. Okay. Uh, I'll just fast forward, it's no problem. Um, what, what advice do you have for a young woman aspiring to be a model? If you're aspiring to be a model, I would say meet up with photographers or start documenting yourself or start photographing um, the way that you look in the light because like you're beautiful and you're obviously starting to see some wonderful things about yourself. So I think that you should definitely put yourself in front of the lens and, and capture pictures, you know, document the beauty that exists within you. And one last question. Uh, what does being human mean to you? Human, human means living, existing, coexisting. Um, you know, like and in this moment of living, you know, I think that we need to address how we can protect each other in times that are a little challenging. And I think that humans need to look out for one another. I mean, if animals can do it, why can't us? Like, why can't we? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I want to say thank you for your time today, Abina. Um, uh, at the Right, excuse Abina. me. I want, I want to yeah. say Abina. Abina. So, like, okay. Abina is Tuesday day born for a female, and then Kwabina is, is Tuesday born for a male. And then, so each day of the week has like their own thing. So, like, there's Kojo, like, you might have heard Kujo, but it's like Kojo is how it's pronounced. Um, and um, and uh, Ajwa is, is the female version. And then there's Kweku, like, I don't know if you've heard of Kweku Anansi, which was like a spider. Um, and there's also Akua, which is Wednesday, female born. So there's just different, um, and Kwame, that's my, my, my youngest brother's name is Kwame and that's Saturday born. And so every, every day of the week has a different meaning. Nice. Yeah. Thank you for Thank that you. information. I appreciate you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, oh, please let them know where they can find you at, by the way. Um, uh, yeah, please. It will be great. Um, what they can find you on. Oh, and one last, just one last question before I go. How was it being on Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2? How was that I'm experience? I'm not going to lie, the people from right. Call of Duty are just the nicest people I've ever met. Like, they're, um, they're so kind and they're so um, supportive and I've been very grateful to have met them and to be able to work with them. It's It's so cool how it's all very, very different. Like, you know, like being somebody who's an artist and um, working with people who are, um, you know, like this, like a, a a game, you know, like a pretty violent video game. But it's it's also um, it's been a wonderful opportunity to meet like really wonderful people. Amazing, amazing. Well, yes. Please let everyone know where they can find you at, um, uh, and if you have any closing remarks. And I want to say thank you once again. Thank you for your time and um, consideration and having me on Human. Um, I uh, am the spotted elephant, which is, you know, like a zebra and an elephant, not knowing what to do with her in the world. In the world. And so that's what I am. <laughs> um, and yeah, I appreciate your time and, and um, effort in putting this together. And I hope that you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Have a good one. Peace.